you know, the biggest difference I see between myself and, you know, intelligent design and creationism is, you know, I'm a scientist. I look at the data and I say, you know, what does the data tell me? What conclusions can I draw from this data? Uh, but I think a lot of apologists and pastors and, you know, intelligent design creationists, I think what they do is they say, well, I have the conclusion and, you know, I need to find whatever for that. Uh, you look at the Ken Ham Bill Nye debate. I mean, Ken Ham essentially said as much. He said, yeah, I admit, you know, I start from the Bible. That's where I start from. You know, no one's going to convince me otherwise. I start from the Bible and essentially I find what will fit that. And obviously that's not the way we do science. Yeah. Um, that's one of the things uh, I noticed. And uh, Jason Lyle uh, was Ken Ham's partner in a John Ankerberg debate with Hugh Ro against Hugh Ross and Walter Kaiser. Hmm. And Jason Lyle said, uh, I start my study of astronomy with the Bible. And Jason, let me ask you this question. Uh, what would you say to a scientist like Murray Gelman, who sent to the Supreme Court of the United States testimony? He's a Caltech physicist and Nobel laureate. And he said, it'd be easier to believe in a flat Earth than to believe the universe is 6,000 years old or anything older than about 15 billion years old? Or what would you say to Alan Hammond and Lynn Margulies in a science article where they say adoption of the young earth creationist theory requires at a minimum the abandonment of essentially all of modern astronomy, much of modern physics, and most of the earth sciences, much more than evolutionary biology is at stake. So what I'm saying is, is that how do you talk to these people that are observing evidence? Can you use any of their evidence, any of their assumptions, or are they all wrong? You know, there, there are a couple different ways I can answer that. First of all, you never give up biblical authority. Because people say, well, you have to leave the Bible out of it. I say, no, I don't have to leave the Bible out of it. This is the Word of God. I know you don't believe that, is what I would say to these people. I know you don't believe that, but I do. And let me show you how the evidence is consistent with the Bible. So that's what I would start. I would never abandon uh, the Bible. And, I, and I, I fully admit that one of the, the main reasons why I believe in a young universe, is probably the main reason, is because it's, it's what I believe the Bible clearly teaches. And I contrast that with what Mary Schweitzer said when she said she looks into her microscope. She said, I don't bring my faith into my microscope. It's all about the data. And the data are telling me a story, and I follow yeah. the truth. There you go. My job is to do the research, to gather data, to present the evidence for a hypothesis. I am a scientist. I, when I wear my science hat, I don't have beliefs. I have only data. It's very boring. <laughs> Data can only do two things. It can either support or fail to support or disprove. I guess that's three. And so um, just this idea that we are just going to presuppose something based not on the Bible, but based on our interpretation of the Bible. Now we've yeah. we've really um, but we we're, we're at a point where we have to ask you this question and, it, and you handle it in your book. And the idea that how much of these things overlap the, this idea hmm. of science and faith and this idea of our hermeneutic of the Bible or or what the Bible is. Is is the Bible inspired by God, written by mortal men, or is the Bible written by God, whispered to mortal men? I mean, this idea of inerrancy. In your mind, yeah. Aaron, how much of, of, of this idea of inerrancy has played a role in people like what you're saying that have come to a conclusion and sift through the data to find a confirmation bias? That's a great question. And, you know, to be honest, that's still one I struggle with. I mean, uh, you know, it's been, what, 16 years since I've been a Christian. It's been, uh, I don't know, maybe over 10 years since I've, you know, kind of, uh, you know, accepted evolution. And I still deal with that. Um, you know, one quote that comes to mind is from John Calvin. He says, you know, God is want to uh, want to whisper to us like a nurse uh, lisps to an infant. Uh, you know, and I think about that with the Bible. I think I think it's a categorical mistake to try to look to, you know, Genesis 1 through 3 for, you know, uh, uh, literal scientific information. I mean, obviously, the style it's written, you can tell it's not like a police report or just kind of a, you know, disinterested retelling of the facts. Uh, this seems like a much different genre of literature. Uh, I mean, there are genres of literature in the Bible where they talk about the temple, the creation of the Temple of Solomon, and they talk about, 
you know, uh, every detail. It talked about how many windows there were and, you know, how many decorations there were. Uh, but when it comes to the creation of the entire universe and, you know, all plant and animal life, we get, you know, measly two chapters. And I think it's a categorical mistake to try to say, well, you know, they were really trying to communicate scientific truths. I don't think that's what they were interested in communicating. Uh, I think there are some primitive, maybe scientific beliefs that are being communicated. Uh, but it is a difficult question. I mean, how do you reconcile biblical inerrancy, that being the Bible is true and everything it teaches, you know, with this idea that Genesis 1 through 2 seems to, at least on the surface, uh, try to be communicating this idea of a very recent earth and, you know, animals coming about through, you know, creatio ex nihilo or something like that. Uh, that's an issue I haven't really fully resolved yet. Um, it's tough because uh, I think what really makes it tough is the issue of, I think, human evolution and the idea of, uh, you know, literal Adam and Eve or not. Uh, because the New Testament does seem to, you know, uh, there's, you know, when Paul talks about Adam in the New Testament, you do get the sense that uh, Paul is talking about Adam as though he was a real flesh and blood person. And so, you know, it's kind of a semantics game at that point saying, well, you know, like, you know, Paul maybe didn't really think he was a real person or Paul thought he was a real person, but God was okay allowing Paul to think that, you know, and that was kind of a cultural idea that God kind of co-opted to teach this larger idea of, you know, Christ. And, and so at that point, you're kind of doing a semantics game like, well, you know, how much can I redefine inerrancy and not lose it? Uh, you know, because the evidence shows that there was not a single human pair at any time in recent history. I know some people have tried to make that work. Like I know uh, Dr. Venom has done some work in that area. Um, but, you know, to be frank, it seems unlikely that we're going to find a primordial human pair that are the progenitors of the entire human race. It's, I'm still working on how do I, uh, how do I, how do I work that into my framework of biblical inerrancy? Cause of course I do want to maintain biblical inerrancy as much as I can, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes I have to suspend judgment. Sometimes I, I don't know and I'm still researching.